Hi, Victory Family Church. It's Caitlin Bryan here with John Maxwell's Equip Organization. And I just wanted to stop by to say thank you for your partnership. Because of your partnership, we are seeing 1.1 million individuals around the world currently participate in our transformation tables. These transformation tables allow individuals to create community and most importantly, come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We actually just got this news in, hot off the press, that now every 47 seconds, 47 seconds, someone is coming to Christ because of the work Equip is doing around the world, and we truly could not do it without you. And I cannot end this video without sharing this big news with you guys. This August, we are gonna celebrate the marker of seeing one million souls come to Christ. One million souls come to Christ because of the work Equip is able to do thanks to your partnership. So thank you for giving through Victory Family Church and partnering with Equip to see lives that were bound for hell go to heaven for all of eternity. We are grateful for you all and look forward to continuing to partner together to expand the kingdom and see souls saved for eternity. Thanks so much. Good morning, Victory Family Church. How are we doing today? All right, all right. Well, hey, if we haven't met, uh, I'm Sean Moore. My wife, Sarah, and I are the campus pastors up at our Meadville location. So shout out Meadville and Newcastle. Join us online, everybody. Come on. One church, multiple locations. And it's good to be, to be together today. I also want to honor, of course, celebrate our lead pastors, John and Michelle Nuzo. Can we just show some love to them? We're thankful for you. We love you. We love you. Can't wait till you're back. But until then, y'all, you're stuck with me. Okay, so today and next week, all right? So plan accordingly, all right? Whatever that means to you. <laughs> but, uh, hey, last week, uh, Pastor John kicked off our battlefield of the mind. Come on. Battlefield of the mind last week. And today is week two, part two. And we're going to dive right in. So if you have a Bible, digital format, whatever you got, we're going to jump right into 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. And it says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, which sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought. Can you say every thought? Every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So if you are taking notes today, which I would encourage you to do, just to simply uh, capture the things that God is speaking to you today, you can write down this title for today's message, which is Demolishing Strongholds. Come on, I mean, that title will put hair on your chest, right? Demolishing <laughs> Strongholds. Thank you, Kathy Spencer, for that laugh of approval. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray as we get in. Father God, we just thank you so much uh, today for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who is our teacher. We ask you to teach us. Lead us into the truth. Not just that we would know more information, but Lord, we put it into practice. That we experience the grace of God within it as we do so. We thank you, Father, for that today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, as we do talk about demolishing strongholds today, battlefield of the mind, and that type of 
kind of warfare-esque language. Sometimes I think when we, because even this the term, if you've heard it, spiritual warfare, which technically is not a term that's even in the Bible. Um, but it's, I think it's important that we frame it or that we're viewing it in the right light. Because you can see that as this sort of like God versus the devil, cosmic spiritual, like equal opposites, going at it head to head in a very physical conflict. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about in that sense today. And I want to frame it uh, to help us see it the right way with a story. And this is a true story. Uh, This is going back to 2016, way back when, right? 2016, simpler times, right? Simpler times. But uh, a Facebook page called Heart of Texas, which had hundreds of thousands of followers that it had uh, amassed, uh, it actually organized a a rally to stop the Islamification of Texas. Uh, It was organized for May 21st. 2016, in front of an an Islamic center in Houston, Texas. Well, after that started to be spread, there was then a counter-protest that was organized uh, to save Islamic knowledge, was the name of the event. And it was organized by the Facebook page, United Muslims of America, for the same day, same time, same location. And of course, when the two groups got there on that day, uh, there was some escalation. There were verbal arguments, people not getting along there in the streets of Houston. Now, the most amazing and interesting thing about all of this is that uh, the people that were uh, operating these Facebook pages uh, were Russian operatives. And they were really using this as a way to spread some disinformation, misinformation, to rile up these two groups, to organize this, all as a distraction. In fact, this uh, disinformation approach uh, has actually been something that Russia as a nation has engaged with going back to the days of the Cold War. And the KJB, and they would spread this information, lies or misdirection, conflicting information throughout the U.S., toward the Western world as a whole, in order to distract, to divide and conquer through deception. And I think it's such a good picture as we talk about battlefield of the mind. That's what we're talking about. The enemy of your soul and mind bringing information to pull the strings on this person, that person, these thoughts, these suggestions, these deceptions about yourself, about others, and about God, which then leads us to actually experience him stealing, killing, and destroying within our lives. We're believing God today uh, that we can destroy and to demolish the strongholds the enemy has tried to bring to you and to bring to me because it's a fight that you can always win. Somebody say amen to that. And so when we talk about strongholds, uh, what we're talking about here in this passage is what the Apostle Paul wrote. He said we're demolishing strongholds. Right after that, he then talks about uh, how we demolish arguments, arguments, And every pretension or thought, we're talking about destroying thoughts, ideas, suggestions, arguments, ideologies that try to take a stronghold within our thinking. Because listen, if I get your thinking, I get you. Romans chapter 12 says that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's for good, but you know, the same thing can happen if we embrace a lie or wrong thinking, we could actually experience a corrupting or a loss of life within our lives as well. And so here as we engage this, we actually see that there are three primary strongholds that we're going to look at today that the enemy brings to you and brings to me. No one is exempt from this. The good news is that, one, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Alongside of that is that the devil is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not really all that new. He's been doing the same things from the beginning, so he's predictable. Therefore, we can be equipped with what we need to always win the battle. We're going to look at three strongholds and three truths that destroyed the strongholds using the time that Jesus was tempted, sorry, was tempted by the devil when he was fasting for 40 days out in the wilderness. And we see this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3 says this. The tempter, the devil, Satan, came to him, Jesus, and said, if you are the son of God, Tell these stones to become bread. 
Now, I think this is a very interesting temptation because I don't know about you, but I haven't been walking along feeling hungry, looking at a rock, going, don't turn into bread, don't turn into bread, don't turn into bread. Like fighting yourself back from the struggle and the stronghold of don't turn the rock into bread, right? Kind of an odd temptation that we see here, but, but think about it this way. I wanted to find this first stronghold as this. Satisfy your desires with what is lifeless. Satisfy your desires with what is lifeless. Turn these stones into bread. So it kind of goes like this. Hey, you've got a hunger. You've got a thirst, you've got needs, you've got desires. They aren't being met. So why don't you turn this rock into your sustenance. Satisfy your desire with this. This will fulfill you. And it's a strategy or a stronghold of the enemy that he brings to all of us. In fact, oftentimes he'll use our desire for good things, even God-given things, and point us toward a lifeless substitute to fulfill it. So if we go to, as an example, within romantic relationships, the enemy will try to come and whisper to us, it's like, yeah, I know, okay, maybe the Bible says to you as a Christian, yeah, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, whatever that means. But, you know, I mean, come on now. I mean, I mean you can change him. You can fix him. Yeah, he may not be walking with God at all, or she may not be walking with God at all, but, but come on, come on. I mean, come on, aren't you hungry for intimacy? You have needs, you're tired of being single and ready to mingle. Let's get to the mingle. <laughs> or maybe in, in the area of our friendships and the same thing. Like, okay, maybe they're not the best influence, but I'm just tired of being lonely. I mean, aren't you hungry for some, some, some people to find your people, find your community? I mean, this is, this is the best we got right now. Or maybe it's in the area of our, of our sexuality. Okay, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe. Okay, maybe the Bible says or God says about, about sexuality being about between a man and a woman and the covenant of marriage. But come on, it's 2023. I mean, and, and, you're, and you're grown up. You're, you're mature. I mean, I mean and aren't, you, aren't you hungry for intimacy? I mean, it's, it's, it's not even healthy for you to suppress that. I mean, this is, I mean, you're going to hurt yourself doing that. Same thing with substance abuse. Man, something's going on. Man, you got a hunger. Man, you got this pain. You got this thing going on in your life. You got this stress and pressure. Hey, look to this. Look, at, look to the alcohol. Look to this. Look to, to that. What is it? It's the enemy saying, you've got a desire. You've got a hunger. May even be a good God-given desire. But he says, here, here's how you can fulfill it. Turn this stone into your bread. Let this, this will fulfill you. And it kind of reminds me, this isn't as much of an issue nowadays, but the way back, sailors would get, you know, stranded. They would shipwreck. And now, of course, they're lost at sea. And and they're looking around, and all that's left is, is, of course, ocean water. Well, you get thirsty enough, you start looking at that ocean water, and, like, I don't care that it's salty. It's going to taste salty, but at least it's something. I mean, I can at least get some water going in here. Well, the, the issue, though, is that if you were to drink ocean water, is that because of the high salinity, big science word for today, the high salt content within it, it's 30 plus percent uh, salt. Well, if you drink that and you make that your water intake, your body is going to go red alert. We got too much salt in this place. And it basically has to try to get that out. Well, the way it flushes flushes it out is through number one. All right, and so it's going to take the the water resources, whatever fluids it can find, it's going to pull it from those places in your body and then expel it. So you're actually going to be going number one a little more often to get the salt out. Well, what happens is there's only so much water you're coming in, and there's a whole lot going out. So you dehydrate. And it's a picture of this temptation of the enemy who says, listen, you're stranded on the island. Ain't no water coming, baby. Not for a while. And so he shows you the ocean water. He's like, here's water right here. Why don't you come, come take it and, and, and drink it? Not telling you that the contents of it will actually cause a greater thirst than you started with. Turn these stones into bread. But how did Jesus respond? Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, Jesus answered and he said, it is written. 
man shall not live on bread alone. He didn't say bread is bad, just not bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here's the truth that he used to demolish this attempted stronghold of the enemy is this. The truth is, living by God's word will satisfy me. Living by God's word, it'll satisfy me. See this also in Psalm 103, verse 5. Psalm 103, verse 5 says about, about God, he says, He's the God who satisfies your desires with good things. What's the result? So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Come on, God wants to satisfy you with good things, the right time, the right way, the right people. God wants to set, see the enemy sets it up as listen, listen if you want to get, if you really want to be satisfied with those desires and needs and wants and things that they really got, come on, you know you can't get that from God. He's the killjoy of all killjoys. He's the God of the thou shalt nots. No, 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 no. no. Come on, come on, come on. If you want to have fun, you got to do it. Come, come with me. Here's a rock. Turn it into your bread. But God comes along, you know, he's not withholding. He said, I want to satisfy you, not just with what's available. You see, you don't have to settle for a substitute. You don't have to settle for something sinful. God satisfies our desires with good Things, things that are actually and truly good, and the result is it energizes you, not depresses you. It satisfies your soul, not stirs up greater longing and thirst. And like, uh, it, it doesn't bring harm. It brings <sighs> satisfaction of the soul. He'll satisfy me with every word of God. Living in accordance with this word, it satisfies my soul. How do we demolish this stronghold the same way that Jesus did? And spoiler alert, the way he's going to do it every time is with the word of God. Lord God, I see the way in which you want me to go. And I thank you that I'm going to walk that way. And in the middle of you feeling this pull of your desires and wants, and I mean, I'm feeling pulled toward this. Engage your mouth. Jesus spoke. He said, it is written. He had the word of God in his heart to such a degree that he spoke it in the middle of that attempted stronghold. He spoke the word of God. The fastest way to shift your body in the right direction and get it on track is with your mouth. Don't have time to read it right now, but the book of James, in the book of James, it actually talks about how our tongue is comparable to like the rudder of a ship, the, the bit and bridle in the mouth of a horse, or like a small spark of fire that ignites a big fire. And it compares it to the, man, if you want to turn and direct and guide your whole body, engage your words. Engage your mouth with the word of God. Why? Because living by God's word, it'll satisfy my soul. It's the truth by which I need to renew my mind to take that thought captive. God will satisfy me the right time, the right place, the right way. The next stronghold is this in Matthew 4, verses 5 through 7. Matthew 4, 5 through 7. It says this. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, and just as a note there, this is the same way he started the last temptation. Hey, if you're the son of God, so he has an appeal to identity. And you'll notice that the enemy is going to call your identity into question. Before the first temptation, he did it in the aspect of your desire and your hunger. Well, if you're really this, if you're really, a, he placed a desire rel related to our our desire, sorry, place to your identity relative to your desires, but he also does it here relative to what's true. If you're the son of God, here's what he says. He said, throw yourself down. They're up on this high place. Just jump off. Why does he say it? For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. He basically says, okay, Jesus, so you're living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Let's find out if that's true. Here's a word from God. His angels will protect you. So why don't you get up here, jump off of this high place. What's there? If you're actually going to be a doer of the word of God, you're going to act upon the word. Here's what the word says, so do it. 
What's this temptation? He's trying to get him to accept or embrace a counterfeit truth. The second stronghold the enemy tries to to lead us into is to embrace a counterfeit truth. He uses a truth. I mean, think about this. He quotes the Bible. The devil quotes the Bible. And he's been around a long time, so it's safe to say he probably knows it better than you and I do. But he quotes the Bible as a way. Why? Because he used a truth to get him to accept a lie. And let's just see Jesus' response to see how this plays out. Matthew 4, verse 7, Jesus' Jesus' response is this. So Jesus answered him. It says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. What's the truth that he used to demolish the lie in the stronghold is is this. The whole word of God is my standard of truth. The whole word of God is my standard of truth. I want to illustrate how this dynamic plays out. Use a little illustration. Psalm 119, uh, verse 160, Psalm 119, 160 says, the sum of your word, talking about God's word, the sum of your word is truth. Now, if we go to math class for just a moment, what does the word sum mean? S-U-M. Yeah, it's, it's the total of adding up multiple numbers, right? It's the result of addition, Well, right here, uh, it's written, David writes, the sum of your word, God, is truth. You could say it this way, if we use the illustration of a puzzle, as the sum of the puzzle pieces gives you the picture of the whole whole puzzle picture. I almost went over to the truth side. The, The word of God is the sum of the word of God, each individual truth, if you will, Put together gives you the full picture of what the truth is. What did the enemy do? He took a puzzle piece and tried to connect it to a lie. Tried to lead him to a conclusion based off of a truth. The apostle uh, Paul wrote to a pastor named Timothy, talked about rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, how do you divide? You need more than a truth. It's the word of God working together. See, a number of different truths in the word of God work together like this. Just to illustrate it, let's think about whenever Jesus was uh, the woman who was caught in adultery, thrown down in front of them. They tried to trap Jesus with this situation. Well, when nobody condemned her, they all walked away. I'm trying to summarize it. But he gets to the end. What he says to this woman who's caught in the act of adultery, he says to her, I don't condemn you. And then he says, go and sin no more. We see complementary truths working together in those two statements. On the one hand is, I don't condemn you. We see a truth of the mercy of God, the grace of God in the midst of our sin. But going alongside of that, that isn't the full picture. It's also, he says, hey, go and sin no more. And when you combine those truths together, you get the full picture of love personified. But what the enemy tries to do is say, it's take the grace of God, for example, and say, hey, you know what, the great, I mean, grace, it's just all good. It just, it just covers everything. No, no big deal. And rather connecting to a truth, he connects it to a lie and says, hey, there, therefore, anything goes. I mean, who are we to judge? Live and let live. You do you, I do me, and we're all cool. What is that? That's connecting grace with a lie. The sum of God's word is truth. Or you could do the same thing with the opposite. You could take the truth, and you know what people need? Bless the Lord. They just need the truth. I mean, just give them the cold, hard truth, right? I mean, just tell them, just, I mean, this is what, this, this is, this is where you're wrong, this is what's right, just do better. Which Christians, to be honest, we're, we're pretty good at that one. Which the people, they just need the truth. Really. So whenever you're gonna eat a burger, sorry, vegans. But if you're going to eat a burger, you eat your tofu burger, you know, whatever you got. But if you're going to eat a hamburger, right, I mean, I'm assuming you don't eat the raw burger meat, right? You probably apply a little bit of warmth to it. Probably season it with something, hopefully, right? It's the same thing. It's taking the, the truth and we're applying, we're applying grace to it. 
Why? Because love personified looks like what? It's truth and grace together. Let your speech be seasoned with salt that it may add grace to the one who hears. What is that? It's the sum of God's word working together that gives us the full picture of truth. The enemy takes a truth and tries to combine it with a lie to get us to accept a counterfeit truth. He does it with doctrine as we just talked about, but he'll also do it with facts about your life. So in other words, he'll take the, the moment in which you experienced a rejection or some sort of trauma or thing in your life and say, hey, you are rejected, which is a fact. It's true. But he says, hey, here's what that meant. That means you're unlovable. He connects it to a lie. Or he takes the fact that, hey, you were abandoned, therefore nobody, nobody wants you. Or he takes the sins of your past and say, hey, you know what, I know what you did last summer. <laughs> he takes the truth that I know, I know what you've been living like, I know what you did, and he combines it with the lie, therefore God will never, ever, ever accept you and tries to get you to take the counterfeit truth. Why? Because part of it is accurate. But then the word of God, if we embrace the whole word of God as our standard of truth, what do we find? Is that God's word tells us, yeah, you, you very well may have done that, or maybe that happened to you, but God's word comes alongside and says, yeah, you know what? But guess what? The blood of Jesus washes us from all sin. The book of Hebrews says that we can come boldly now before the throne of grace to obtain the mercy and help in time of need. And it destroys the lie. And it destroys the lie about who you think, how, how you think God is. And you find out, wait, God, God is rich in mercy. Yeah, that happened to me. Or yeah, maybe I did that. But God's not done with me yet. He's still got plans and purposes for my life. What does that for you? What does that for me? It's receiving the fact that the sum of God's word gives us the full picture of truth. And you might say, fantastic, that, that, that's great. But does that mean i got to memorize this whole Bible in the next, like, 90 days? Right? Because the enemy's coming at you. He's coming at me. But here's the good news. The one that inspired and wrote this book through people, the Holy Spirit, if you've given your life to Christ, he's living inside of you. And Jesus actually sent him to live within us, work within us. One of his primary job descriptions is to reveal truth to you. And that goes beyond your brain. So as a result of that, you can encounter situations and information, ideas, suggestions and things, and you hear it and you see it, and you may not be able to go, this is the chapter and verse, and here's the Bible verse that goes against that, but you'll go, mm, something's not right about that. I'm not going to accept that as truth about myself. I'm not going to accept that as true about God. I'm not going to accept that idea, that way of thinking, the way of viewing the world or seeing those other people. I know I've got the spirit of truth living within me. Why? Because the whole word of God, the things he speaks into my heart, the things he speaks to my word, as I get into that consistent time with him, what is it? I've got the word of God now to stand against the stronghold of counterfeit truth in my life. And the third stronghold that we found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Matthew 4, 8 and 9. And it says this. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Here's the third stronghold that the enemy tries to bring to us and brought to Jesus. Is find your significance Apart from God. Find your significance apart from God. You could have the good life without God. He showed Jesus all the kingdoms and things of this world. Oh my goodness. All that you could have. You'll just bow down and worship me. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I don't tend to experience that temptation. as like, well, I'll try not to bow down to the devil today. But what is it? It's finding my significance, all that God wants to do in my life, through my life. Find that a different way apart from God. Man, you could have the fame, you could have the money, you could have the success in your life. Your marriage, just, just, you, would, you just got to take matters in your own hands sometimes. 
I mean, you can't, you can't live on God's clock. I mean, you know how long he's been around. You know he's not in a rush. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day is what the word says. So it's like, come on, God. Like, come on, we got to get to moving and shaking a little bit around here. Man, if you would just compromise this, if you just kind of fudge a little bit on this, if you just go this route, I mean, just come on. Why don't you just go out there and just embrace your dreams? Run for it. Go for it. You can find it. You could, man, you'd be so much better off without God. Your life would be better. That's the temptation that he brings to us. What's interesting is um, there's a minister um, who's in heaven now, but, but Kenneth Hagin, he had a vision where, where God showed him this picture, showed him this vision. It was a couple, a pastor and his wife that he knew but didn't know them real, real well. But God used it and just kind of spoke to him in his heart. Hey, I want to show you how the enemy works and work within this specific situation with this couple that he knew. And so he just showed him this vision, showed him this picture of uh, the man and his wife, the pastor and the pastor's wife. And then he saw this little, like this evil spirit that, that came over to the wife and just began to whisper things to her, began to speak different thoughts and ideas and things to her. Things like, you're so beautiful. Man, what a shame, though. I mean, you could have had fame, you could have had popularity, you could have had wealth, but you've been cheated in this life because you're a Christian. What a limiting, small life. All you could have had. What a shame. And then the, the woman, the wife, she recognized this thought and said, no, 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 in Jesus' name, I resist that thought. And sure enough, then that, that little spirit just took off running for a while. A little bit of time goes by. Here it comes back again, jumps on her shoulder, so to speak, and begins to whisper those, those thoughts again. Oh, you're just, you're so beautiful Talented. I mean, it's just gone to waste, though. It's, it's wasted on the church. It's wasted in the kingdom of God. It's wasted being a Christian. All you could have been, all you could have done, you could have been known, your name and lights. And, but what a shame. So sad. And so she recognized it again and said, no, nope, no, I'm not going to think on no, In Jesus' name, no, get out. No, I'm not going to think on that. It takes off again, second time. A little bit more time goes by, third time. Comes back to her. Same thoughts yet again. You're so beautiful. You're this. All you could have had, but your life has been wasted because you're a Christian. Oh, so sad. But this time, she entertains the thought. And it began to show, the way that Kenneth Hagin describes it, it showed like on her mind, it's almost like you could see like this like black dot against a vision, but just sees this like black dot begin to form on her mind. Because, man, the enemy, he's, he's persistent. But this thought, she begins to just kind of mull it over a little bit in her mind. Think it over, thinking it over, thinking it over. And over the course of time, those thoughts that are meditated, because that's how, that's how thoughts work. It's not like you just wake up one day and psh, you just blow your life up. Thoughts are like seeds germinating over time in the cultivation of our mind that eventually produce a harvest. And it, since I'm on that, we might as well mention this. You and I are where we are today, who we are and how we are today because of the thoughts that we've either accepted or rejected. But this thought she began to chew on in her mind, if you will. And eventually it gets to the point where he, he saw the, this wife, this pastor's wife, with her husband, a pastor. And she turns to him and she says, I'm leaving. I'm done with this life. I'm going to go and live this other life now. And she separated from her husband, went off into doing, living like the world, basically on her own terms. And the moment in which she did that, he saw that that dot that had formed on her, her mind went down and now became a place now resting on her heart as she embraced and now acted upon that thought. And it's a picture to us of the approach of the enemy, especially within this area, all that you could have been, all you could have had. But Jesus' response in Matthew 4, verse 10, gives us the answer to tear down the stronghold. And he says, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. Notice that there is an exclamation mark on this. 
away from me, Satan. So this isn't like, like casual Jesus, like, well, just, just get away. I'm just going away. Like, it's not just like half-hearted. It also isn't like a begging, like, oh, please, devil. <laughs> There's already been two temptations, and this one's number three. And I'm hungry. It's been 40 days. Can you please just leave me alone? Like wimpy, sad. No, this is from a place of authority. Can I tell you, if you're going to stand against the thoughts, deceptions of the enemy throughout this life, throughout this world, you're going to have to put the big boy pants on, the big girl pants on, and use some tood. Some attitude, right? The kind of attitude maybe some of y'all gave to your parents, all right, growing up. And, okay, that wasn't the right application. This is the right application. That you treat those thoughts as like man, something's coming to steal something precious, to destroy your life. And you recognize the thought. And he said, away from me, Satan. Well, then he says the word of God. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, I'm not going about this on my terms, my way. I'm not building my kingdom merely on my own. I'm building the kingdom of God. I'm on God's agenda, not mine, God's approach. I'm not taking the priorities of the world. I'm taking the priorities of God. And so I'll worship him only. Not me, not fame, now, what my eyes rest on, not just the, the dreams and goals that other people have for me. God, what do you have for me? Good things. Good things on God's terms. His way. God is worthy of my worship. So the question today is this. Which, as we look at these three strongholds and, and every temptation and attack and lie and thought of the enemy. And I'm not saying that literally everything is, is the devil personally to you, whispering that to you. But this world is laced with his ideas. Because it's all fallen. This world is in a fallen condition. These types of thoughts, these types of ideas, the ways of seeing things, the ways of thinking. And one part of us is, is, is still hasn't been made new yet. Our bodies, when you were born again, your spirit was made new your mind wasn't, it needs to be renewed. One day we'll get new bodies. Fantastic. Until then, we've got a body that needs to get put back on track with the word of God. So therefore, these three strongholds, maybe it's in the area of our body and desires and those kind of things as we talked about. Is that maybe the area that God's putting his finger on that he wants to bring life to? He wants to bring truth to that sets free from those bondages of thought and belief and persuasion. Or maybe it's in the area about what you believe to be true, embracing a counterfeit truth about yourself, about God, about others, that, that you've embraced because it's partially true. Yes, that happened to me. Yes, that, that. But God wants to bring the sum total of his word into that area to set you free from that. Or maybe it's in the area of your significance and what God wants to do with and through your life and the enemy is trying to offer you a different path and a different way. And it's time to give that to the Lord and say, God, I'm all in on worshiping you and your direction and your path for my life. I give you my yes. Where is it that the Holy Spirit wants to direct you today? At every location, will you just bow your heads, close your eyes with me? And right now, let's like you just invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, teach us, show us. Where is there an area that the enemy has gained a foothold? Within our beliefs, within our persuasions, even at the level of desire. And Father, we endeavor to get into your word to let you whisper your truth to us. And that your word, just as we talked about that negative result of a woman that allowed those thoughts to germinate within her mind. But Father God, we allow the seed of your word and your truth to find its resting place within us. That it would produce a harvest of life and a harvest of freedom and deliverance from every lie, every thought that would try to exalt itself above the knowledge of you. We take it captive by faith and we bring it into submission and to obedience to Christ. And what your word says. Thank you, Father, for it today. And with our heads bowed and eyes closed in this moment, 
at every location. Perhaps you're here today and you'd say, that's great, but I don't know where I stand in my relationship with God just in general. And I want to give you an invitation to receive the fact that Jesus was sent on a rescue mission from heaven to earth to die upon the cross as payment for the sins of humanity. And he rose from the dead so they could give us this free gift of eternal life by putting our faith in what he did. Listen, I'm not asking you if, if you're a moral person. That's wonderful. That, that's great. But I can tell you, if being moral could earn you right standing with God, then God just would have said, hey, here's a bunch of commandments. Just do them and do, do really good at it. But he didn't do that. He sent himself. He sent Jesus to live the sinless life that you and I should have lived but, but never did, never could. So that he can give us his perfect record of obedience in life through his sacrifice. If you haven't received that gift, I want to lead you in a prayer to receive it. You haven't gone so far. You're not, you're not just, oh, I've, I've just messed up way too much. No, it's a gift. You didn't earn it. He earned it for you. But have you received it? I, I would love to lead you in a prayer to receive him as Savior and Lord right now. But first, I want to give you a chance to acknowledge before God that you need to do that. On the count of three, with heads bowed, eyes closed, every location, no one looking around. On the count of three, you say, I want to make Jesus my Savior, my Lord. I want to receive his work for me. On the count of three, would you lift up a hand high? I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Then we'll pray. One, two, three. I need to choose Jesus today. God bless you. I see it. You can put it right back down. Lift your hand up high before the Lord. God bless you. I see it. You can put it right back down. Online, you just put it in the chat. I'm choosing Jesus today. And we celebrate that with you. And whether you just now raised your hand or you know that you should have, we're all going to pray this prayer out loud together with you. Listen. This prayer doesn't save you. It's the faith you're expressing through it that ultimately saves you as you put your trust in him. Just repeat this prayer out loud with your own ears right after me. And we're all going to pray it with you. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. He died on a cross for my sins. And he rose from the dead so I could have new life. Jesus... I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. And I am now a child of God and heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate together today.